So uh, welcome everyone. This is our second machine learning seminar organized by Machine Learning Group at the University of Auckland. Uh, our second and virtual event. Uh, we are happy to have our guest from US, Principal Scientist William Cohen from Google. And just before we uh, give the chance Pat to introduce him properly, uh, to tell you that the event is one hour. We'll try to keep uh, the talk around 45 minutes and have 15 minutes for questions. I will let William decide whether he wants to be interrupted or have the questions at the end of the session. Um, so you can write uh, questions, everything like if you want any, any questions to ask to the guest, you could please use the QA and the chat options. So we're gonna then select questions and ask William. I think that's about it in short. So uh, yep. I guess now Pat is, Pat, please take <laughs> a few minutes to introduce uh, the guest. Yes, so William Cohen and I've known each other a long time. We won't mention how long. Um, uh, we were graduate students well, together. Let's work it out, Pat. Come on. <laughs> it was a long time ago. 1986? Uh, about 30 years, right? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's yeah, when you came to, to Rutgers. So 1986, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, we were graduate students together. He worked at AT&T and he was a professor at Carnegie Mellon for many years. And now he runs the natural language group at Google. And I will take it away, William. Do you want qu interrupted or not with questions? Um, so let's go ahead and say, yeah, ask questions if I kind of like, um, I'm saying things that, that you don't follow. Um, uh, if I don't pay attention, I can only see like a handful of faces here, right? Um, so maybe, maybe Pat, if there are like questions, then you could like sort of, you know, wave right. at me from inside your virtual tent or something like that. Um, All right. You know, I, I'll kind of get in the zone. I have to excuse myself. I'm not like, I spent so much time on things that are not Zoom. So it gets so we, kind of we can we can let attendees. So if you see a question, we can also promote yeah. you to speaker, so you can ask a question in person. So just type in a question, and we will let you. So perfect. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you for um, inviting me here. I guess it's great. It's great to be here today. Or actually, maybe it's tomorrow or yesterday. I guess here it's yesterday. Um, uh, from your point of view. Um, so yeah, I've been at uh, Google Research for a couple of years now, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the line of research we've been uh, pursuing there. Um, so this is me and, um, and many other colleagues at Google. Um, and um, yeah, there we go. All right. So um, Let's talk a little bit about, um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm talking about answering questions, which is a natural language processing problem um, using neural knowledge representations. Let's, look, let's break down a little bit what that means. So, um, so answering questions is an NLP type problem. Um, and um, uh, for people that like learned NLP, you know, back in the dark ages, like maybe, you know, five or six years ago, um, natural language processing systems are these sort of complicated devices. Um, there's a, a pipeline of different steps where you tokenize things, split things into sentences, you do things like part of speech tagging. And then there's this hierarchy of tasks um, ending with more and more semantically um, difficult tasks. Um, uh, and uh, all of that's changed over the last few years. So in 2020, most natural language processing systems look a bit like what you see on the right here. Okay, so most of them are basically um, uh, you take raw text, or pretty much close to raw text, you run them into um, a thing called a neural language model. Um, and what that does is it basically learns to predict tokens from other tokens nearby, right? So it's basically just a predictor that's predicting some of the tokens in the text from context. Um, uh, and uh, that, that model is going to basically learn a lot about language just from observing a lot of raw text. And then finally, you'll take some task specific data for whatever task you're interested in, sentiment classification or parsing or what have you, 
Um, and then you'll basically fine tune the language model. So just add a little bit more training data um, to that same basic model, maybe with a few layers added on top to get it to do what you want. Um, so in 2020, this language model might actually often be a masked language model. That's an NLP joke. All right, it doesn't get any better than this, sorry. Um, so um, I, the reason these things work is largely a question of scale. Um, so uh, you can learn a lot about language if you look at a lot of text. Um, so um, uh, a typical large model, and this is not the largest one that's out there um, at this point, um, but like the T5 model, which came out of Google maybe three months ago, has 11 billion parameters. It's trained on most of a terabyte of text. Um, so there's a lot of data that is used to sort of lightly supervise these things and teach them uh, things about language. And they learn a lot about language, which makes it, which mean, which is why that this sort of simple fine tuning process can be effective. Um, but they also learn about a lot of other things as well. So um, an interesting paper from a year or so ago um, was language models as knowledge bases question mark. And what they showed is that in, in addition to learning a lot of things about language, these large language models also learn a lot of things about the world. So, um, so the simplest language model um, or one simple kind of language model um, is called a mass language model. So you take a piece of text and then you replace some of the words with these special tokens called mask. And the goal of the language model in training is to reconstruct um, the missing word. Um, so they did some experiments where they took facts from a knowledge graph. Okay, like Dante was born in Florence. Okay, so this is just like, you know, a database of like known facts about the world. And they turn each of those facts into queries. <clears throat> that you basically into sentences that you could um, treat as um, prediction problems for this mass language model um, to, just to see whether it knew the facts that were in the knowledge base. And it turns out it knows a lot of facts. Um, so here are some examples of uh, prediction problems that were posed by basically taking um, facts from the knowledge base. So the original language of Mon Uncle Benjamin is, uh, and the correct answer uh, that you're looking for is French, and that's the correct answer. That's the top score answer from the language model. Um, uh, Gordon Scholz is a member of the blank political party. The answer you're looking for is labor. The answer they get is labor spelled um, in this like very incorrect, like British looking way. Um, uh, and it also knows a lot of like common sense things. So Ray, Ray, Ravens can blank. Right, and the top scoring answer is flaw. Or a joke would make you want to laugh. Um, not the top score, but uh, it's a reasonable answer. So, um, so these language models seem to know a lot about the world. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? So uh, I would actually claim that in some ways this is a bad thing. So we'd like to use these things for NLP, but we don't want to, um, uh, rely on a model that um, has a lot of world knowledge, which might actually be fragile and might change. Okay, so politicians can switch political parties, uh, for example. Um, and uh, in general, the world changes. It would be nicer if you could have a real knowledge base, a real representation of knowledge, um, uh, and um, be able to um, uh, use that as your store of knowledge rather than whatever the neural language model uh, picks up implicitly. Um, so this is what we'd like to do. We'd like to basically take a neural language model and somehow incorporate external knowledge. And one of the goals is, you know, we'll have a knowledge, um, a language model that will can respond to updated knowledge. So when the world changes, you can just update the knowledge base rather than retrain the whole model on terabytes of text. Um, and um, you'd also, um, like to be able to do the sorts of things that we know how to do with um, modern or traditional symbolic representation. We'd like to be able, for example, do um, complex compositional reasoning, which language models tend not to be able to do very well. Um, so this is what we'd like to do. And just to kind of back off, I'll sort of like look at a slightly simpler problem. So how do you basically incorporate a knowledge representation into any kind of neural network, any kind of neural model? And what I mean, when I say knowledge representation here, I basically mean something which stores a large number of facts and lets you do something that looks like symbolic reasoning over them. So that's the question we're going to talk about. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly about um, three uh, papers um, in this uh, line of work. So uh, the first one is the system called NQL uh, for neural query language. So I'll just sort of like jump in and talk about that. Um, so, um, and actually sort of before I talk about this, I'm gonna talk about something else which some of you may be familiar with. Um, so there's actually been a lot of work um, at the intersection of neural networks and knowledge bases. And the most heavily investigated problem is something called knowledge base completion. So what's knowledge base completion? So we've got some facts, we've got some little knowledge base with relations between entities. Um, and um, what you'd like to do is you'd like to basically sort of extrapolate and add um, plausible edges that might be missing. Okay. Um, so for example, if I know that William Cohen works at Google and he's a co-author with Hai Chin Sun, it's plausible to assume that Hai Chin Sun also works at Google, not necessarily true. So knowledge base completion is a way of getting from triples that you know to be true to ones that are plausible. So how do you do that? <clears throat> well, typically what you do is you write a neural network, right? That takes some sort of vector encoding of each entity and relation. So the inputs are um, vectors that encode the three parts of that triple. Hai Sun works at Google, okay? And then you take those vectors and you run them through some function that gives you a score, which is a measure of plausibility. Um, so that's the basic idea. And there are lots of different functions that have been proposed, but this is the basic idea of high knowledge based completion. So again, this is a way of sort of extending a set of triples. Um, now, um, this is similar to, but different from what we, the way we kind of normally think of not logical inference, right? So in logical inference, we would have um, a bunch of facts. We also have some logical rules, right? Some things that let us logically conclude new facts. And we use that to come up with new triples that are entailed by the, the true triples of the rules, okay? So this is another way of extending some set of facts, but it works quite differently, okay? Um, and the first step toward modeling this, if we kind of sort of abstract away from, you know, the logical inference where we do this kind of like, you know, deduction iteratively and complete some sort of closure. The first question is how do you basically sort of like handle the left side of the rule? How do you basically do this sort of compositional reasoning? How do you answer a structured query? Um, so the first level of, of, of um, modeling you need to do if you want to do reasoning is basically answering compositional structured query. So, find the values X where X reports to Z and Z works at Google, right? That's sort of an example of a simple uh, query, composition query. Um, and um, uh, what I'm gonna consider here um, for the next couple of sections of the talk are query languages that do that. So these are query languages that do this particular kind of um, answer these particular queries. And there'll be queries of a, query languages of a particular type. So they're basically data flow languages for sets of entities. So we'll start out with a, maybe a single set of entities, so just containing Google, right? Then we'll follow the inverse of the relation works out. So Z would be the set of all people that work at Google. Then I can take that set Z, and in my notation here is we're going to follow the reports to relation, or its inverse. Okay, that gives me another set Y. So that's how I would compute um, this kind of structured query. So these data flow languages are um, based on sets, are you know, certainly a limited form of structural uh, reasoning. You can't do everything with them, but you can do quite a bit. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Okay. So um, what I'm looking at now then is something which is a little bit like knowledge-based completion that we're taking triples and we're extending them. Okay. But the focus is on getting answers to um, query languages. And we wanna get the same answers as logical um, systems. Okay. But I want to get the answers in a way that facilitates plugging them into a neural network. And that basically means making the operations like completely differentiable and making all the data structures numeric, all right? So just again, to give sort of a concrete motivation for why you wanna do this, okay? So a, a kind of a widely studied problem is question answering against the knowledge base, KBQA. So I would get a question like, are any Google interns attending KBC 2020 in natural language, okay? And then you would take that natural language query and you would convert that to some, some structured query language, right? Um, and this is something that's often done neurally, right, nowadays. So you basically sort of like parse that question and understand what it means. And then you could just use sort of a traditional symbolic query language 
to query a symbolic knowledge base and get the answers. Okay, so that's sort of like the old way of doing that. Um, what I'm proposing here is you take the query language and you put it also inside the neural network and you also put the knowledge base inside the neural network. So all the computations going from the original question to the predicted answers are done neurally. Okay, and the advantage of that now is that in principle at least, um, you can train this from just the um, questions and the target answers. Okay, in this setting, what we had before, I have to train the neural network to give me a structured parse of every query. And that's hard to do. I have to generate structured parses for every query. So it's a difficult data collection process. Here we just need the answers. Um, and the way the learning goes is you would compare the predicted answers with the target answers. You compute some sort of loss, right? And then you back propagate that the loss, that error, right? Back all the way through to um, the modules that understand the question. So the um, neural query language here is basically just sort of being used as a, as a way of translating the loss in entity space to a loss in query space. Um, so the conjecture is that you really want to do something kind of like logical inference when you do that. So if the answers you're training at are ones that are actually entailed by the knowledge base according to unknown but, um, but, uh, but um, constrained structured queries, then if you did the knowledge base co completion thing and you actually generalize the knowledge base, then you'd end up with answers that were a little bit off, right? So that would essentially look like noise in the training signal. So that's the conjecture and we'll sort of see some experiments later on that, uh, that support that. So again, we're focusing on getting the same answers as a logical knowledge representation system, but using differentiable methods, okay? So going back to this, uh, this paper, so the first system we um, built for doing this was called NQL. Uh, it, was, uh, it was published in uh, iClear uh, earlier this year. Um, and um, here's uh, what the query language looks like. So there actually is a query language in this system. Uh, and this is very much what the code would look like. You construct some sort of query context, which lets you basically do the sorts of things like defining a schema and loading data that you do in a knowledge representation system, okay? And then you can write um, uh, these data flow operations uh, as functions basically of this context. So if I wanna construct a singleton set, this is a singleton set just containing uh, um, the entity named Henry VIII of House of Tudor of type person, okay? If I wanna find the wives of Henry VIII, then I can um, just use this notation and that will basically sort of find all the things that are related in the knowledge base by the wife relation. So if you remember your British history, which you might or might not, there were, you famously had six wives. Uh, so this would be a set with six uh, elements and they're all weighted sets. So everything here is, is smooth and continuous. So um, the sets all have weights by default to 1.0. Um, if I wanted to ask where the grandsons of Henry VIII, I might do a query kind of like this. So this is sons or daughters, and then followed by the son operation. Um, so uh, all these expressions evaluate to weighted sets of entities, okay? There's also a notion of a weighted set of relations. So you can also do sort of a second order version of these things. So you can follow some set of relations and another set. And if I wanted to make R1 be the set son or daughter, and R2 be just the set son, then this expression here will end up being uh, the same as the expression above it. Um, or you could have some sort of like soft weighted version. So you could have things where those numbers are sort of like gradually tuned. Um, and in, predict in particular, those sets could be defined by some neural function. So this is the basic idea behind NQL. Um, the implementation is actually pretty simple. So this kind of key operation of following a relation is done by a matrix multiplication. So you have a matrix which represents the adjacency um, uh, matrix for a relation. Um, and then uh, every set is represented by a long sparse vector um, uh, where you have ones in the components that correspond to elements of the set and zeros elsewhere, or you know, non-ones, you could have other positive numbers. Um, so, um, so this is the basic idea. Um, uh, and there's some engineering behind that to make that effective for kind of modern kind of like um, uh, accelerators. Um, so this scales up to um, a few tens of millions of triples. 
um, and maybe a few million entities. Um, uh, so this is this is how NQL uh, uh, works. Um, and then sort of breaking it down here, if I wanted to answer questions like this one, what would I have to do? Well, the idea is that this 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 structured query is going to be something that's latent, right? This is going to be uh, something that's that's not going to be explicitly written down. So one way of doing that is to write a template for the structured query that you're going to find, and then define neural functions that will fill in each slot for the template. So if I'm asking for queries of this form, right? I want to find things that are related to some set x1, like Google, and some other set x2, like VLDB 2020. Okay, and I want to intersect those things. So that's the template I want to use. Now I have to have neural functions to generate each of these sets. Okay, and then once again, the learning is basically we're back propagating the target answers um, against the, some loss in the predicted answers. And um, what, since this is all sort of deterministically defined by the query language, what you're basically learning is how to extract these uh, parameters for the templates. Um, and, you know, if you have um, a more diverse set of problems, you might pick many different queries, many different templates, right? And then you'd have to choose between them somehow, okay? Um, and you could even do something a bit more complicated. So you could have an encoder decoder approach. So you're choosing between many, many different templates sort of in a virtual way. Um, but this is the basic idea behind how we're going to use NQL. Um, so this is the basic scheme we're going to use. And just to make this very concrete, here's one of the tasks we looked at. So probably the most widely used like sample problem for web for uh, KBQA is this task called Web Questions SP. Um, this was originally done over the Freebase um, uh, data set. We used a subset that had about 40 odd million triples, about 12 million entities and about 700 relations. Um, uh, there's about 4,000, 4,700 odd questions. And each of them has an entity set answer. Um, we don't have to extract the sets of entities like Google or VLDB that appear in the question. Those are kind of given to us here. We know what entities appear in the questions um, as part of the data set. And all the questions are basically either you know, of this form or this form. So either we're following one relation, starting with our kind of initial set of entities in the question, or following two relations, one after another. So we have to learn those. We have to write neural functions for each of these. So using basically sort of like the simplest, most common loss function and um, uh, a very simple um, neural model for how to produce those sets, we end up with results kind of like this. Okay, so I'm not actually showing you the ones for web questions SP yet. These are some uh, linguistically simpler tasks, okay? So this is a synthetic data where you have up to five hops through a um, knowledge base or up to 10 hops through a knowledge base. So this shows you can answer quite complicated questions reasonably well in this framework. These are sort of like one, two, three hop questions on a, on a database of movies. Um, and again, the system is working uh, quite well. So uh, GraphNet here is, is one of the, is basically sort of the prior state of the art for two of these three problems. And you see, we're not too far off from that. Um, so for web questions SP, which is the hardest one of these tasks, we're actually a fair bit different from the prior state of the art. Okay. So, uh, so here's the short story. So this works, but maybe not quite as well as we'd hope. So why does it not work as well as I'd hope? Um, and now we're kind of getting to a little bit more information on neural networks. So here's a little bit more detail on how neural networks um, work. And let's start by putting this in the context of language models, because we're going to come back to language models pretty soon. So what do language models look like? So in a language model, you um, take a bunch of tokens. Some of these are masked out. Okay. Um, every token has got some sort of numerical encoding. So it's encoded by a long vector. Okay. And then there's a basic, you know, neural module that's repeated over and over again, where you take those token encodings and you transform them. You do this many times. So maybe like, you know, 12 times or 24 times in a kind of reusable transformer model. Um, these representations are pretty big. It might be a thousand floats um, in a kind of plausible language model. 
And then at the end of the day, you want to predict the actual tokens that were in the language and the original text, including the ones that were masked out. So how do you do that prediction? Okay. So the prediction is done like this. Okay. At the output layer, when you're predicting a token, so remember every one of these words is, uh, and one of these tokens is encoded by a numeric vector. Okay. So there's an encoding for every um, vector. All right. And these encodings are also learned on, on by the language model. Okay. So, but there's one that's associated with every token. So these token encodings can be thought of as stored in just some giant matrix. Okay. So when you're predicting a word, what you do is you construct a vector Q, which is an approximation. It's um, the direction in embedding space that you think that word might lie. All right. And then you find out what the distance is between your query vector Q and all the other vectors. And distance is just dot product. Okay. So you look at the dot product of all those things. Then you compute those to probabilities. Okay. And that gives you a probability distribution over all the tokens in the vocabulary. So that's how you do the prediction at the end of the day. Okay. You have a representation of every token in a dense space. And to do a prediction, you choose a point in that dense space and pick the things nearby that. All right. Um, so that's what the language model does. And it's, you know, it's trained to basically recover mass data. Um, so, and this is a very popular and powerful trick in neural networks. You have your objects that you want to predict. You construct a query vector in that sort of same dense space. You convert that to a probability distribution. This happens over and over again. And it's a very powerful idea. But here we're not using that idea. So remember I said the vector that we use for a set is a long sparse vector. Okay, so when we're predicting a set of relations, you basically have 700 independent predictions. You're not doing something like this, right? Instead, you're making 700 independent predictions. Okay, and that makes the problem a lot harder. So we're basically not exploiting one of the kind of powerful ideas from neural networks, this idea of embeddings. So how can we do that? All right, so that's the next section of this talk. All right, how do we um, construct a query language for embedded entities and embedded relations? Okay, so um, just a kind of call out here. So Hyun Sun is the first author on this paper and he did uh, you know, basically all the work in the letting you talk about. Um, so, um, so I, uh, I should point out there actually is an interesting line of prior work on this. Okay, so there have been a couple of systems for, um, from Yuri Leskovic and people associated with this group that basically are systems that are designed to structure answer structured queries on on embedded knowledge bases. Okay, and the way they were evaluated was basically by looking at sort of this part of the problem, not on whether they actually did the right thing logically for pupils uh, that were entailed um, by the query, but whether they sort of successfully guessed in this sort of space for things that were, you know, there are some mix of plausible interpolations, completions of the knowledge base and reasoning. So that's sort of the old way of evaluating that. And here I basically want to look at uh, this corner. So this problem hasn't really been looked at before. Okay. Um, and it turns out the techniques that people have used in the past don't give you very accurate inference. Um, so this is the main issue that we're going to look at. Um, and to get accurate inference, um, we developed basically a, a new representation for sets. All right. So um, for uh, in our system, MQL, every set is encoded by a pair of two things. All right. So the first one is kind of the old representation that I just told you about. So A of X is, um, uh, so there's an, uh, an embedding for every element of the set. Okay. So we've got some sort of uh, vector um, that represents every element. And um, we have a query vector, um, which when you're computing that would just be the centroid of the um, embeddings of all the element, elements. Okay. Uh, and um, this gives you like some one notion of what's in that set. Okay. But it's not a very powerful notion because there are many sets that you can't describe sort of uh, simply with a single um, uh, distance in this dense space. So the other part of this is something called the Countman sketch. So uh, you may or may not be familiar with this. This is a randomized data structure. It's a little bit like a continuous Bloom filter. Um, and it has a couple of really nice properties for this purpose. So I can take any long sparse vector and I can embed it, encode it as a Countman sketch. All right, and there are a couple of uh, properties. So one is 
if I want to have a, a small countenance sketch, I can, I can encode things accurately if they're not too many non-zeros. So if I have a sparse set, you know, maybe 100 elements, that's not too bad, okay? Um, the other thing is that there's some small probability of error. Um, and again, I can make that error um, uh, exponentially smaller by sort of increasing the size of the sketch, okay? But every time I query that sketch, there's some small probability of an error, okay? Um, so the other thing is, so NQL is based on representing adjacency matrices for relations as matrices. An adjacency matrix is extremely sparse. If you have 12 million entities in your knowledge base, as we did um, in the um, um, web QSP experiments, then you have 12 million squared elements in the adjacency matrix. You can't store that even on a really big GPU, not even close. Um, so you have to use sparse data structures, which are not really all that well supported. We kind of made them work, but they're not that well supported on um, hardware accelerators. Um, so, um, so the countman sketch can be represented with a dense vector or a dense matrix. Um, so it's a dense matrix that has a bunch of zeros, but it's still a dense matrix structure. Um, so that works much more nicely on accelerators. Um, so this is the basic um, representation. So if I want to recover the elements of one of these sets, here's how I do it. What I do is I basically take the top K elements, okay, using A of X as a query. So I score things. I, and there's actually an efficient way of finding the top K things um, uh, by dot product um, uh, using neural retrieval methods. All right. So now I'm going to take all the entities that are in this set and I'll rescore them. All right. So crucially here, I want to know how I have some idea of how big the set is. So maybe the set can be only be 100 elements. So when I take the top K, I'm going to take maybe the top 1,000 things. So I'll rescore the top 1,000 things. So I only quite query the sketch about 1,000 times. So I don't need a really large one. I can deal with um, a small sketch. So conceptually, you can think of this as basically a centroid. Uh, the, the centroid is basically a fine grain type for the elements of X. And then B of X is basically sort of like a detailed description of what the weights of things in that type are. Okay, so um, the nice thing about the other nice thing about this representation is it's easy to do a prediction. So if I want to predict, I'll do it the um, kind of like um, uh, transformer way for we use for predicting tokens. I just produce a point in embedding space. Okay, and I'll let the sketch be vacuous. So I'll basically just like take the top K things and rescore their weights by distance. Okay, so now we're predicting an embedded representation, not an entity ID. Um, the other really nice thing about countman sketches is um, it's uh, they're easily closed under like addition and um, pointwise multiplication, which correspond to set union and intersection in vector space. So um, you sort of get um, unions and intersections in your query language for free. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'll just skip over that last little detail. The last step is how do you follow a relation? Okay, so to follow a relation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the knowledge, I'm going to build a knowledge base by basically taking an embedding of every um, triple as follows, right? Every triple is a relation, a subject, and an object. The subject and object and the relations all are associated with um, vectors, embeddings. Okay, so we'll just paste them together and that's a representation for a triple. So now if I want to find something like the things that are related to X by relation R, I take the centroid for X and the centroid for R, and I construct a query that looks like this. So if I find the things that match this closely, I'll find things that have the right relation and subject. Okay, and then I rescore these with the triples, with the sketches for, um, for, uh, for X and R. Okay, and now finally, I just have to extract the um, objects from these and convert it back, back to um, the, the format. So this is basically one retrieval operation, one top K query, and there's very little error in it. Um, so this is really different from the prior approaches for uh, doing uh, knowledge base um, encodings, um, uh, structured queries on embedded knowledge bases. So um, in the prior work, essentially, you represent following a relation by having some sort of a linear operation in embedding space. So it's some numeric operation that takes you from things in the, from object op embeddings to, um, to uh, subject embeddings. 
and you have a different transformation for each relation. Okay, so uh, the problem with this is that that it, this sort of doesn't have a lot of capacity. So if there's slight differences, um, you you basically can't sort of model the fine grain detail in a in a relation. Um, so our approach is very different. It's, it's non-parametric. So you you actually look up the object. So if the things, the actual embeddings you want for the objects here are as follows, this is not going to get you there with some sort of simple linear operation. Um, but if you look up the things that are actually related to X4 and X3, you'll get these. And now you can sort of reconstruct the set from there. Um, so this, this tends to be more accurate. Um, okay, so this is the basic idea. So um, I so the way we use this essentially is you start with your knowledge base and then you have to train the embeddings to um, support the kind of reasoning you want to do. All right. Excuse, so excuse, the, me, Will, the, excuse me, Will, if I can interrupt you. There is one question before you move on. So yes. uh, from Neen Pam. We and can, I'll, we can also let him just ask himself if he wants to. Uh, you can. It's yeah. OK. So the question yeah. is, what is the relationship with? OK. I mean, I just have a probably a technical question about like I couldn't get to have the relationship when you you know like you construct a count means scan out the vector vx, right? Yes. And then you get count means as a matrix vx, but I I don't get the relationship between ax and vx because it's actually telling you how you answer the question, right? I right. Well, they both give you information, so you can think of a as sort of specifying the type of the answers. Okay, uh -huh. and the type is defined by a region in embedding space. Okay, and then B gives you sort of like detailed weightings of the things that have the right type. Okay, so the type might be, you know, I don't know, male big screen movie actors. Okay, right. and then B, you know, weights it very specifically, you know, so like the weight is now all on like Danny DeVito and, um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, and that way you can represent, you know, who are the male leads in the movie Twins. Okay. okay. So like the idea okay. of using count means scale, just like you compress the, what's called the vector V, right? Yes, you're compressing the vector V and, but you're, but by combining it with the embeddings in this particular way, okay, okay. You are, you're getting some of the advantages of the embedding um, and some of the computational advantages as well. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, I got it, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so the training operating step process is actually very simple. You sort of generate a bunch of sets of uh, entities by looking at the knowledge base, um, and then you generate a lot of set expressions. Um, so, um, in our uh, training process, what seems to work reasonably well is just to look at sort of like one-step relation following operations and unions, and then you train. The embeddings to give you the right answers on these things. So you train them to give you the gold answers for those operations. Um, uh, and um, uh, once you're done with that training process, and once the these simple inferences work really well, then you basically fix the embeddings for all the knowledge bases, and you train the rest of the model. Okay, so you're sort of back in the same situation we were when we were training a model based on MQL. Um, you just now have sort of like a different knowledge base module. So, uh, so here's some numbers. Um, so uh, this is the most complex of those um, meta QA questions, okay? So this is NQL and this is MQL. So we've got a, a fairly large improvement, okay? And now beating the state of the art. For WebQSP, sort of like what we, the sort of our first cut was not quite better than the state of the art, but it's actually quite easy to get to the state of the art. So the model I showed you, which is literally the model we used, it basically looks at sort of two different templates, covers, you know, about like 85% of the cases. And, you know, there's like one more relatively rare case. And if you add another template for that, then you uh, can get a sort of new state of the art for that task as well. Um, the other interesting experiment is kind of comparing to these older systems that work on um, uh, structured queries on embedded knowledge bases. Um, so the better of those two systems was also published at iClear this past uh, spring. And here's a sort of the direct comparison to them, okay? So um, 
This blue bar is performance, uh, and this is a kind of a funny measure, hits at three on three different um, tasks using their sets of uh, test queries, their kind of synthetic queries. And you see we're making, there's a huge difference or you're getting sort of from like, you know, the 40s or 50s up into the 90s. Um, and both of the components of MQL um, uh, contribute. So MQL um, minus this, this orange line is basically not using the sketches. Okay, so it's using the embeddings and it's using the strict of doing retrieval instead of uh, a linear operation for um, for following for relation following. Um, so that that that's that's kind of the rough story with that. Okay, and and I should point out like when we compare it on you know the problems that they were looking at specifically, you know we're still slightly better, but it's it's much closer. So they really weren't looking at faithfulness to logic or semantics, which is what this is measuring here. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm going to like circle back and maybe take another five or seven minutes or so talking about um, uh, the last round of work, work, work we've done, which is a paper on archive and recently submitted to tackle. Um, so what I'd like to do, my motivation for doing this, I talked about at the beginning was basically putting this query language and a knowledge base inside a language model. Um, so how do you do that? I mean, there's a big gap. So language models are all about language. They don't really have any connection to entities. So we're actually starting with um, uh, a language model that's already been extended to handle entities. So this is another piece of work from Google, um, not my team, but it's called Entities as Experts. And essentially every entity, like every token is, is associated with an embedding and every entity is associated with an embedding. Um, and there's layers that are ordinary transformer layers, and there are also layers that, for the um, the encodings that correspond to entities, um, are basically allowed to go and do a retrieval into this entity memory, get the result back, and sort of splice it back into the system, fold it back in uh, to the system. So essentially, what we've added is a new type of layer that lets you query that entity memory whenever it wants to. Um, and this model is trained in a slightly different way. It's trained um, on text that has hyperlinks in it. So there's both known entities with known IDs um, and, um, and, and text. Um, and you're trying to train it to recover both of those things. And then at the end of the day, you fine tune it on a task like we did before. So the tasks we're looking at are trivia questions that involve entities. So an example of a question that you, in a fine tune, that you tune on is where did Charles Darwin live blank, right? And the answer is apparently downhouse. Um, but you would also be training it on just declarative sentences in the pre-training stage. So you run a lot of text to it, which was um, a text that was augmented with entity IDs. Okay, so um, this model works pretty well. Um, and in fact, on uh, these trivia-based questions, um, here's, some, uh, here's, some, uh, here's some numbers. So these first three things on the left are systems that are quite complicated and work the way you'd expect an NLP uh, question answering system to work. They take the question, they retrieve some text from a big corpus, right? And then they read that text and try and answer the question based on the retrieved information. So those are still sort of like the state of the art. The things that are just language models, which are on the right, actually do surprisingly well, all right? So T5 is just a big language model. Okay, and this teal thing here is entities as experts, and that's that's doing better than existing language models, even though it has you know only one percent of the number of parameters. And actually, if we look at the cases of trivia QA where the answers are in the entity vocabulary for entities as experts, it doesn't even matter. Uh, so this is sort of a pretty good starting point. And what we did was we extended um, this with uh, one new component. Um, which is essentially the follow operation from MQL. So this is um, very recent work, as I said, Pat Ferg is sort of the, the lead author on this and Hai san also had some important contributions. Um, uh, and like I said, they're letting me talk about it. Um, so we have a new memory, which basically has facts in it. Um, every fact is constructed compositionally. There's an embedding for the subject and embedding for the relation. And you piece those together to get a key and when you query this memory, you query it with a vector that approximates one of these keys in that kind of usual sort of way. Um, and um, then that key is associated with a value. 
Um, and when that value is retrieved, you sort of fold it into the output the way we did before. And um, there's some uh, sharing here. So these entity representations here are the same entity representations that you use in entities as experts. So it's strictly a, a, a generalization of this model. Uh, and uh, here's the way it works. Um, so um, so free-based QA is a subset of trivia QA, um, which is designed to be answerable using facts from freebase. Um, we're not using freebase. We're using a slightly different, more recent knowledge base Wikidata. Um, so there's a little bit of a mismatch. Um, uh, so on the full data set, we, uh, we still beat the state of the art by quite a lot. Uh, and these experts also beat the state of the art by a lot, but we're doing even better than that. And on the answerable section, we're doing even better. Uh, and for web questions, that's P, we sort of see a similar result. For the set of the things that we actually resent, that we actually represent, uh, we're doing quite well. Um, okay, so um, now I'm gonna sort of circle around to like one of the things I started out with. I started talking about, wouldn't it be nice if you could put uh, um, a knowledge graph, a knowledge representation inside a language model? Um, and one of the arguments I said for doing that is that you could then update the language model when information changes, okay? So we haven't shown that we can do that. Like, so we're, we're showing that we can take some advantage of that information, okay? But the answers to the questions might be in many different places, right? It might be in the pre-training data. If I have a question like, where did Darwin live? That might be actually in, you know, some text that was read when the system was being pre-trained on Wikipedia. Right? It might be in the fine tuning data. In fact, for many of these questions, uh, for many of these data sets, um, in particular for these two I'm looking at here, um, there are questions where there's a, a question in training and a, um, a very similar question in testing. So I might have actually learned to recognize some paraphrase of that question. Okay? Or it could be getting information out of the fact memory, which is what I want. Okay? But I haven't shown it's really doing that. Um, so we want to really exploit the fact here. This fact memory is a way to inject knowledge into the language model. So to simulate that problem, what we did was the following thing. Okay, what we basically did is we kind of carefully filtered all the training data, the pre-training data and the fine tuning data so that we didn't see any hints about what was in the test data. Okay, then we test. Okay, and there are two models here, EAE basically all it can really predict is some sort of like fine grain type. So where does you know Darwin live? It hasn't seen any direct evidence about that. Well, it, maybe it's a place or a house or something like that. And that actually does surprisingly well. Okay, um, but uh, what we're showing here is we're getting a very large jump, um, basically by um, just being able to use the, um, the knowledge graph. So here, this fact memory is basically the only source of uh, information about the actual answers to the test cases. It's not in the training data uh, uh, near uh, seven. Okay, so um, I said I would take about 45 minutes and I'm not too far off that, uh, but I do wanna leave some time for questions. So I'm not gonna say a whole lot more about this. Um, so neural networks and machine learning are really changing the way we do AI. Um, and um, one thing that we're finally getting around to is reinventing how knowledge about the world is represented and stored. So the old kind of symbolic knowledge representation approaches had some pros and cons. So the con which people focused on, it requires you to control the knowledge. You have to engineer what's in that system. Um, but because you have engineered it, you can control the knowledge. And sometimes that's a very powerful thing to be able to do, okay? So what we've seen is basically just sticking a lot of knowledge in as knowledge as parameters and training a huge language model on a lot of text works much better than you think, okay? And as the language models get bigger and bigger, it does better still, but there are some things you just can't do easily. You can't update it, right? You can't influence what it's going to do. It's hard to understand. So this is sort of a middle ground. We have neural models that will look like a knowledge-based query language, okay? but will be things you can embed into a neural model. So in particular, things that are fully differentiable and don't require GPU unfriendly operations. So this is really a very new area. Um, uh, like all the work I've talked about today has come out in the last, well, it's been published since May. All right, so this is a very new area. Um, 
but I think it's a very exciting area, and there's a lot of uh, space for um, for uh, for work in this uh, in this area. So I'll I'll go ahead and stop and uh, take questions from the audience now. So I see Michael Whitbrack has his hand up. Yes, Michael. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Auckland. Um, I, so why, thank you. Welcome yeah. to Wednesday, I, you should say, right? <laughs> and to Wednesday, to the future, in fact. Um, yeah, the future's being built in New Zealand every day. All right. Um, enough of the advertising pitch. Uh, so I, I had a question. You, so the, the, the work that you're talking about and the kind of query languages that you're talking about so sort of rest on this follows operation, right? Which is this sort of linear chaining reasoning operation, which has been very popular in the QA um, yes. literature. Um, and then sort of the neural network reasoning. Uh, also, theory. also like conjunction and union. Right, right. right. So, so kind of um, binary predicates chained together via um, horn clauses in some sort of characterization. Right. Yes. And, yeah. It's slightly less expressive than that, actually. You can do things with horn clauses you can't do with this kind of data flow language. So I've, I've become very keen on like um, more expressive um, types of rules, right? Uh, and problem decompositions and problem uh, answer compositions. But I, I, I wonder how much you, know, you think that that matters. Like, so is it something about the uh, query sets that we're building so that more um, expressive reasoning isn't required? Or does that stuff just not matter all that much and I'm sort of uh, uh, chasing you know, futile, futilely chasing a useless thing? Well, I mean, there certainly are some things that are kind of important. Um, so um, uh, I didn't sort of emphasize this too much. We don't really have true disjunction, okay? Um, you can disjoin, you, you can do a union of sets that are of similar types, right? But if, if you have like one set, so Scott Fallman called this the, um, the kangaroo ashtray problem. If you have a set with a kangaroo and an ashtray, then the centroid of those two objects will be like very far apart. There's no type that subsumes them both, right? So your set of candidates will be very large and your sketch won't be able to sort of score them all. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't represent cert certain types of sets. It also doesn't represent really big sets. So there's no natural way of basically saying, you know, the set of, you know, all countries other than New Zealand, right? Okay. Um, so it doesn't do negation. You can sort of do some sort of approximation of set difference. Um, the other thing I think you mentioned was like sort of like non-binary um, relations. Um, so um, there is, I think, a lot of interest and a lot of value in relations that sort of like don't fit the kind of simple binary relation. And there are like sort of a bunch of flavors of those. So like um, in Wikidata, there are these notion of relations that have um, attributes associated with them, right? So, you know, like, you know, um, you know, X is CEO of Y, but there'll be like a start and end date, right? You know, um, so there's, there's often the possibility of sort of qualifying relations in various ways. And some of those qualifications can be quite complex and can involve other entities. So you can do that pretty easily. Um, going to non-binary relations and in a more general way is actually kind of hard because um, I sort of know how to represent a set of entities, okay? I don't really know how to set, represent a set of entity pairs very well, okay? So once we start looking at arbitrary sets of entity pairs, which is what you need for full, you know, I don't know, reasoning about events, then there's sort of like this um, kind of intrinsic problem, right? You have to somehow characterize the way all those things uh, it might interact with each other, okay? And I don't know what the right solution of, is, of that is. So when you're looking at neural modules, right, it's a very restricted setting, right? You can't really have an algorithm, right? I mean, you know, the neural network is just like, it's a circuit, right? You know, it's this fixed step circuit. You can do like, you know, so many operations and then you're done, right? So you can't do like belief propagation or, you know, you know, inference steps like that, that sort of like iterate the convergence. So it may be quite hard to do some things in logic um, in this kind of setting. We have two more questions in the chat. Um, I'll let Nin ask himself again. 
Mm, do you want to get ahead? Yeah, just another question about probably some technical stuff from the papers. Because from the presentation, I found like you're going to use the maximum in the product charge, right? You try to kind of find the probably the target entities and then you do another filtering. And then I think from the paper, I see like you mentioned like you do it quite a few times, right? Especially when the, the, num the number of triples from, from your knowledge base is quite huge. So does this cap the, the main bottleneck? Uh, uh, yes, so the retrieval is definitely the most expensive part. Okay. okay. Um, the model, yeah, so there's like the um, uh, 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 a dictionary of a million entities and there's a dictionary of um, um, a million and a half triples that are sort of derived from that. Um, and um, this is a scale and, you know, like we're running like uh, order a hundred million, like, um, you know, um, documents when we're doing our pre-training. Um, so this is a scale that would be hard to do outside of Google. Um, so, um, I, so this is kind of where we are sort of in terms of our computation right now. Um, so um, there are ways of scaling up, but they sort of get um, beyond, you know, like sort of a few million triples, but they get more complicated and they run up with, you run into systems that actually behave kind of differently in test and training. And you have to do training sort of like with so somewhat carefully selected um, uh, 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 subsets of the knowledge base. So, I mean, we're, I think we're gonna get there, but that's, a, that's definitely a research problem and um, yeah, I think I think this would be an expensive thing to do um, uh, um, in uh, in a uh, in a you know an academic setting if you're just you know limited to like a you know a handful of GPU machines. Okay. So, will any yeah, cap the fast mid solver can help you to scale up the the problem? So. Um, it's not only about the MIPS problem, right? It's also the other stuff. So the um, retrieval is definitely the most expensive part, right? If okay. I was doing this, if I wanted to make this a lot faster, what I'd be doing is I'd be thinking about, and we are thinking about this, right? Thinking about schemes where you do a retrieval over a smaller, but you know, example dependent um, subset of the knowledge base. So you'd preemptively choose, you know, 10,000 you know, triples from the knowledge base and, you know, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand entities that you're going to model for that mini batch, right? Um, uh, I mean, the actual operations themselves can be done really fast, but of course, when you're training, you have to do them really, really, really fast. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's sort of the issue. I mean, there's also things you can do by sort of scaling by, um, Right now we're training everything like completely end to end in sort of the purest, most beautiful way possible, right? Um, I think you probably wouldn't lose much at all if you basically sort of train the entity representation and then fix that, right? And then train the transformer layers that um, do the retrieval against the um, fact base, right? And that would actually be a lot faster um, uh, for, kind of various technical reasons it might be a little hard to get into. Um, uh, there's also, I mean, you know, this is like sort of like, you know, a continual sort of thing. So um, so doing these fast top K operations um, on architecture we have, which is these dual tensor processing units. Um, I, you know, this is something that people are kind of like actively working on improving and making better now, right? So I know there are things that give you, you know, not quite an order of magnitude improvement, but it's a, sort of a substantial improvement that we could be using, that we should be using, and we, we just haven't sort of like switched over to the latest and greatest yet. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, these are these are all complicated and challenging problems, I think. Um, okay. There's another question from Peter. Just sorry. Hi, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, yeah, do you have time to take this question? You okay? Yeah, yeah. So just uh, cognizant of... Uh, like I said, my bedtime's at 10 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the chat, uh, for the talk. That was uh, super interesting. Um, it's it more just a kind of uh, question about the ultimate 
uh, use case of a system like this, um, especially as someone who works quite a lot with um, using the kind of uh, uh, large language models from, uh, of course, Google and, uh, you know, Facebook, OpenAI, um, I feel a bit like, you know, the, the kind of seagull following the trawler in terms of waiting for the big companies to output, you know, a really nice model and then, you know, you can fine tune it for your own needs. Um, in terms of this kind of no language model and knowledge base combination, are you thinking um, of an ultimate kind of use case where you just have a kind of large canonical knowledge base that is general or would you see the eventual use case as being you can switch out your own, you, you put in your knowledge base um, uh, for your use case. So if you're like a company, you would put in all your uh, clients and all your products um, and the, the kind of relationships between them, uh, who's dealing with who, um, and then you could query that through natural language. Is that something that you would see this? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be like a great application of this, right? So you would train it to like answer questions, you know, about your org chart, right? You know, using data from Google, right? And then you take it and you could use the same model and just like unload, upload a different backend database, right? And answer questions about, you know, the government of New Zealand or the University of Auckland or whatever, right? Um, so the ability to swap one knowledge base for one, which might be, you know, proprietary or just, you know, sort of like not of high interest, right? I mean, another situation where it would be really useful to be able to do this sort of like update would be, um, you know, for, um, you know, for things that change a lot, right? So if you look at like, you know, I don't know, um, you know, technical, you know, gadgets, you know, that, that are updated all the time, right? And, you know, it's hard to find knowledge to pre-train, you know, uh, a question answering system for, I don't know, Netflix, you know, shows because new ones come out all the time and people haven't talked about them yet, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, um, you know, um, you know, electronic products, right? They'll be like, they'll be happening all the time, but, um, uh, the first information you get is going to be some manufacturer's specifications, not uh, not not text. Um, so um, that that would be one um, value. I think there's also sort of like kind of like a philosophical issue, right? So um, if you look at these language models, they're very powerful, right? But there are also a lot of things that they absorb that one would like them not to absorb, right? So there are all sorts of issues associated with bias and fairness, right? And how do you even sort of begin to kind of sort those things out, right? So I think the kind of long-term research agenda is, and you know, this is a very hard problem. I mean, this is like, you know, I think a multi-decade problem to figure out, but I think the long-term research agenda is trying to understand how do you modularize these various sources of knowledge because I feel that's the only way you can sort of really separate out the sort of observational stuff from, you know, other kind of like intrinsic things. So um, I don't think we know how to do that. I think that part of the story may be um, being able to sort of compartmentalize the kind of knowledge that um, might change or might be updated, or you might just want to sort of sequester for other reasons, right? Um, uh, so that you can control what sorts of generalizations the system makes. So uh, with something like that as well, um, you're talking before about, um, uh, along with the ability to kind of uh, chop and change information on the fly, if you had uh, kind of a fixed representation, potentially you wouldn't need to, you, you, you could do this with no training from the kind of client side. So if, as long as you put in your database with a kind of, Standard right, right. And that was the last experiment I talked about, right? So the last yeah. experiment I talked about, right? Um, the only information you have about the test cases, right, is from injecting facts at the final stage. Okay. There's no other information about those test cases. So that's the that's the that was the that was the thing we were trying to simulate with the data we had. Um, it's a simulation, you know, we had to sort of like do it by deleting and sort of like putting things back. Right, but that's the goal. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's much appreciated. We have one more question, or at least somebody raised. We will allow that, and that will be the last then. 
So, okay. please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, very good talk. And uh, I just have a question. So actually, uh, it's very interesting for you to talk about the, like, the logic reasoning. So um, but actually, uh, my question is, uh, like from those type of very large uh, pre-trained language model, uh, so in term of, in terms of using this uh, language model to do and combine with the uh, knowledge base to do the uh, sort of the reasoning, uh, I think this sort of has less uh, in interpretable and explainable. So actually, have you think about to use some other uh, like the structure, like the tree structure or some graph structure to do this sort of the reasoning? I think this sort of structure can be uh, more helpful to uh, do the reasoning uh, instead of the uh, like the preprint language model because it's quite a lar large and quite black box to be used. Have you? Have yeah. You well, I mean, I guess like you know the the query languages behind MQL and MQL are a little bit like that. So you know under the hood there's like a computation tree, right? But that computation tree is basically sort of like a compact sort of tree structure you know, based on like sort of like a few operations. Um, uh, so that, that data flow diagram is a, is a compact and interpretable version of what you're doing. Um, and you can make it approximate like the logical inference as much as you like. Um, uh, but there's a, there's a practical reason for wanting to have um, the system be embedded in a language model, which is you know, right now language models are you know, as I said, sort of beginning of talk, they're kind of the way people do NLP, right? You start out with a language model and then you fine tune it, right? So the, the, the way to get people to use your system is to expose it as a language model that they can, you know, pull out, you know, Roberta or, you know, T5 or whatever the latest, you know, GPT-2, whatever the latest and greatest thing you can fine tune is, right? And plug in your system Right and get results with it. So, the um, the I think the 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 practical argument for language model is that um, that's the tool that kind of um, uh, uh, is uh, most easily transferred to users at this point. Um, and a query language is something that's I think kind of harder to use. Um, so that's, that's sort of the reason for combining those two things. Um, I mean, you certainly can do, I mean, we've done experiments where you basically take, you know, instead of using a simple bag of words classifier, you know, to construct the initial queries for, um, you know, MQL or MQL, you have a BERT model, right? So you can have a, a language model sort of combined with it in a different way, um, rather than sort of trying to integrate it inside the language model. Um, but I feel like this is this is the way that's most likely to sort of have kind of a broad impact for many people, um, uh, and you know maybe that's you know uh, maybe that's that's not like correct long term, but uh, I think that's probably you know for you know my group and you know the influence we want to have within the company, I think it's sort of like the right path to, to pursue. Um, thank you. So thank you all for uh, coming. I apologize for the 10 minutes over the, we are over the hour. First of all, thank you to William accepting this doing in the evening and I hope <laughs> you, uh, you can have a nice evening and sleep after this talk. Well, thanks for everyone who attended. At this moment, I also want to invite you for our next talk, which is scheduled approximately in a month. We will have a guest from Italy, Ambra de Montes, and she'll talk a bit more about adversarial machine learning, another topic which is pretty interesting today. Uh, looking forward and everything that's going, we are all living online, but machine learning models are not so powerful to basically, um, they have failures and this can be easily, um, how to say, misused. So looking forward to see you in a month then. Thanks all for coming and have a nice day and have a nice night, William. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.